Okay, well, let's get started. And I want to welcome everyone uh, to this webinar uh, that is hosted by the Whale Sanctuary Project. I am Lori Marino, the founder and president of the Whale Sanctuary Project. And uh, today we're going to be discussing uh, some very up-to-date issues in law and legislation for captive dolphins and whales. As we know, in 2019, Canada passed Bill S-203, the Ending the Captivity of Whales and Dolphins Act, phasing out captive dolphin and whale entertainment facilities for good. Now the proposed Jane Goodall bill adds further protections to the earlier bill and also uh, is aimed at phasing out elephant captivity and includes new legal protections for many other captive wild animals. So Canada is safely one of the world's leaders, if not the leader in strong legislation in the world in the protection of captive whales and dolphins, as well as other kinds of animals. The question everyone is asking is, could anything similar to these bills be enacted in the United States? So in this webinar, I'm going to be talking with three experts and friends who are going to be discussing Bill S-203 and how it was accomplished, the Jane Goodall bill, and how it is, or act, and how it is faring um, through Parliament, and what other legal gains are still needed in Canada, and whether legislation of this caliber could happen in the United States or elsewhere. Uh, before I uh, introduce my guest, uh, a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, if you have a question, and we will be uh, taking questions from the audience, please put them in the Q&A, and we will make sure that we have plenty of time for discussion and to get to as many questions as possible. So today, uh, I want to welcome all the participants and especially my guests. Let me start with Dr. Naomi Rose who is the marine mammal scientist for the Animal Welfare Institute in Washington, DC. And she's been working for years on campaigns and coalitions addressing problems with cetacean captivity, trade and live capture, both in the US and internationally. She's testified before Congress four times and is a member of the International Whaling Commission Scientific Committee. Naomi has co-authored or authored more than 35 scientific papers, and she lectures internationally. Her work was featured in the book, Death at SeaWorld, Shamu and the Dark Side of Killer Whales in Captivity by David Kirby. And uh, Dr. Rose received her PhD in 1992 from the University of California at Santa Cruz in biology. And her dissertation uh, was focused upon social dynamics in wild orcas. She has worked on four rehab and release projects for cetaceans over the years. So I wanna welcome Dr. Rose to our program. Next is Camille Lepchuk, who is one of Canada's leading animal rights lawyers and has worked for over a decade to protect uh, animals. As a lawyer, Camille seeks out cases that enhance the legal interests of animals, exposes animal suffering, and creates meaningful policy change. As an advocate, Camille's work includes documenting the commercial seal hunt in Canada, exposing cruelty in farming, factory farming, protecting free speech of animal advocates, and campaigns against a range of issues, including trophy hunting, circuses, zoos and aquariums, shark finning, puppy mills, and many, many more. Camille is a graduate of the University of Toronto, Faculty of Law and Mount Allison University. And she is a frequent lecturer and media commentator on animal law issues. Welcome, Camille. And finally, but not least, Marty McKendry, 
who is a lawyer and senior parliamentary advisor in Canada to two senators, the Honorable Pierre Dauphin and the Honorable Marty Klein, sponsor of the Jane Goodall Act. He previously worked with Murray Sinclair, the Honorable Murray Sinclair, to draft and introduce the original version of the bill. Marty also worked with the Honorable Wilfred Moore to draft and advance Bill S-203, the ending of captivity of whales and dolphins. Now it is law, as I mentioned. As well, Marty worked to advance many successful animal welfare and environmental protection bills in the 42nd Parliament as Director of Parliamentary Affairs to the government representative in the newly independent Senate. These bills included C-84, animal fighting and abuse, um, and many others, including C-55, the Marine Protected Areas Expansion. Marty has a master's degree in philosophy and a law degree from the University of Toronto as well. Welcome to everyone. Today, I'd like uh, to ask Camille to start us off with uh, giving us the big picture of how captive cetacean uh, issues have gone uh, in Canada. Neil? Thank you so much, Lori, for that and for the introduction. And thanks so much to everybody who's tuning in. And please bear with me for a moment while I attempt to share my screen. Sure. Okay, I think that's working. Yes. All right, great. So I'm going to speak with you a little bit about the broader context that led up to the passage of Bill S203 that banned whale dolphin, and dolphin captivity in Canada. And uh, what I hope to accomplish with this, and I appreciate this is primarily an American audience, is to give you a sense of the decades of work, literally decades that went into this ban. Um, you know, I think of it kind of like an iceberg. You, you, you see the end result and the headlines uh, reflect the fact that we had this victory. But there was so much work by so many people over the course of so many years that went into this. So I'm going to give you a few sort of highlight points uh, that created the right social conditions for this legislation to pass. And I'll just say as sort of a prefatory remark to what I'm about to, to share with you is that uh, as a lawyer, I've come to think of making social change as being possible in sort of two primary conditions. Um, one is when societal attitudes are such that people support and really want a type of legislation or a bill that you're attempting to pass. And the second is when there is not enough opposition to overcome the power of the people who want that. And I hope to show you as we go through this, how people power really grew and blossomed throughout this campaign and how the power of the two aquariums in Canada that kept whale and dolphins that were the opponents in this campaign, uh, the power of those two entities really diminished and set the stage for us being able to pass this. So uh, yes, as I mentioned, there are two aquariums in Canada uh, as of recently that had whales and dolphins in their possession. Most of those whales and dolphins were at marine land. So I'm going to start with marine land and then move on to the Vancouver Aquarium, which had the smaller number. There are slightly different contexts, as you'll see. So this is a news story from the summer of 2012. So, you know, about a decade ago next month, uh, I would say things started to really heat up in the controversy around marine land. This is not a new controversy. Marine land has been around since the 60s, confining whales and dolphins, and at one point was a very, very significant tourist attraction in the town of Niagara Falls in Ontario. And that's about two hours outside of Toronto and uh, right across the, the, the river, of course, from Ni Niagara Falls, uh, United States, New York. So, you know, for many, many years and decades, there have been protests at marine land, people unhappy with the fact that they can find, can find whales and dolphins and seals and many other animals, and quite a lot of news media lawsuits. But things really started to heat up in the summer of 2012 when a bunch of former whistleblowers, sorry, former employees came forward as whistleblowers and spoke with the Toronto Star, the, the largest um, regional newspaper, um, about what they'd seen. And this is just, um, I think, the first story, but over the course of that summer, there were just many, many stories. Uh, this story, you can see an image there focused on a seal whose name I believe was Larry, who was suffering from vision problems, likely due to water quality issues in the aquarium. Um, that summer, there were terrible water quality problems, and that's what prompted many people to go to the Toronto Star and blow the whistle about that issue and many others that they'd experienced. 
this wasn't just a domestic Canadian story. The troubles in marine land actually captured international headlines. And, you know, ex-trainers spoke on the record with the Toronto Star about what they'd experienced with respect to the, the animals. And it became a very, very um, big concern at the time. This is just a sampling of the headlines that came out over the course of the summer of 2012 or 2012. Um, but, you know, countless former trainers and employees came forward and described abuses that they'd seen, uh, inadequate conditions, the deaths of animals. There were revelations that there was a mass grave on the property that housed thousands of animals and had never been inspected by the Ministry of Environment. Uh, you know, questions about the death of baby belugas and, and, and whether proper housing and social grouping played a role in that, um, you know, injuries like a killer whale who was allegedly bleeding for months. So this went on, I would say, you know, every couple of weeks there was a new story. So the pressure was sustained and it was high. Uh, Marine Land, frankly, didn't do much to dial down that uh, temperature and, and tenor of the coverage because they started suing the people who'd spoken out against um, what was occurring there. So the former trainers and former employees, and of course the Toronto Star and many media outlets that have published this information got hit with lawsuits too. Uh, and, you know, frankly, that all that that did was raise the profile of the issue even higher. Um, they made ridiculous allegations, you know, against Phil Demers, who was the main whistleblower who came forward and has been fighting Marine Land for the past decade. Um, they accused him of attempting to steal or wanting to steal a walrus from marine land and keep it in the bathtub, which of course is absurd. That lawsuit is ongoing. Um, so this is happening over 2012, 2013, and then Blackfish comes out in 2013, and that really started to take things to the next level. The public in Canada, and especially Ontario, was already primed to be concerned about marine land and the issues there. And the revelations about what happened to orcas at SeaWorld, I think, really contributed to the idea in people's mind that what was happening at marine land was problematic and not something that people accepted. Um, marine land, the controversies continued. They, uh, you know, continued to sue. They, they, they sued everybody left and right. Um, they even sued a student filmmaker from California. I think that that is what this headline reflects. Um, and, you know, frankly used rhetoric that I think was designed to inflame the situation, which, uh, you know, ended up being beneficial in that there was more coverage. But what this ultimately resulted in was some legislative change at the provincial level. So the province of Ontario, the minister uh, who was responsible for animal welfare, decided to put forward a bill that would outlaw keeping orcas in captivity. Now, at the time, Marine Land had one sole orca named Kiska, who'd been living by herself at Marine Land after various calves that she'd had over the years died. And after a breeding loan with an orca from SeaWorld um, fell through and that orca returned after a court fight. Uh, so it was a significant move to see provincial action. Now, the ban uh, that they were proposing exempted Kiska, this lone orca, out of the practical difficulty of either moving her or doing something else to alleviate her situation. Uh, many groups were pushing for them to ban the, the keeping of all marine mammals or certainly all cetaceans at the same time, and that did not occur. They did um, allegedly improve some standards for the keeping of those other animals. I, I don't think it was a significant legal step for them and hasn't resulted in much change so far as we can see. But it was still a big deal that the legislature felt compelled to act, you know, about three years after these allegations first started being made and, and the coverage really started increasing. And not long after, we saw the first uh, movement at the federal level, too, to address the situation caused by whales and dolphins stuck in captivity. So Senator Wilfred Moore, and Marty will have a lot more to say about this, proposed the first bill that would ban captivity in whales and dolphins in the summer of 2015. Now, Canada had an election uh, that fall, and so the bill was reintroduced later that year in a very similar form. So we're starting to see the seeds of legislative action because of the fever pitch of the coverage and the public sentiment that this practice was really problematic and because public opinion had turned against marine land. And I will say throughout this time that we've seen public opinion polls in Canada uh, really start to move in the direction away from people believing that it's acceptable to confine animals for entertainment in zoos and aquariums. So that's sort of a broader societal shift, but it really manifested itself, I think, particularly in concern over whales and dolphins. So I'm going to shift now to Vancouver and the, uh, the situation of the Vancouver Aquarium. So they are different facilities. Marine Land is a very you know, explicitly an entertainment-based facility where people go to see whale and dolphin shows and to observe animals and tanks. 
It's a theme park, it's a family fun park. Vancouver Aquarium describes itself and bills itself as a somewhat different entity. So they attempt to focus more on research. They do do some important rescue and rehabilitation work of marine mammals who become stranded. Uh, but they, of course, did confine, you know, whales and dolphins, specifically belugas and dolphins, and, you know, at one point, a, a false porpoise as well. Uh, so that is, is um, who was primarily kept at the Vancouver Aquarium. Marine Land had dozens of belugas and, you know, about five dolphins and one killer whale. And the uh, Vancouver Aquarium had significantly fewer. The, the numbers fluctuated over the years, but they had a handful of belugas and a handful of um, dolphins, typically. So uh, Vancouver Aquarium Uncovered, this is a film that was made by a local filmmaker, Gary Charbonneau, that uh, was critical of the aquarium in billing itself primarily as a rescue research organization, but also confining whales for captivity in the, those conditions inside tiny tanks. Uh, it was, you know, it was no blackfish. It certainly did not have the budget or production values of, of that film, but it did get some local media. And Vancouver Aquarium responded actually by um, getting quite upset about this and suing <laughs> the filmmaker, which again, we saw this with Marineland, the, the idea that they're now litigating these cases increased the coverage and I think got more and more people thinking about the appropriateness of keeping these animals in captivity. While this was all going on, there were various lawsuits, uh, whales at the Vancouver Aquarium started dying as well. Um, you know, very quickly, two whales died, Aurora and, K and Kila. Um, they were belugas who'd been kept there for quite some time. And the Vancouver Aquarium was never able to diagnose what their cause of death was. They actually made some vague allegations that perhaps activists had been involved in poisoning them, them in some way through an unknown toxin, which I think was pretty upsetting to a lot of people as well. Now, like Marineland, there have been protests at the Vancouver Aquarium for decades. Um, they've, they have a very long history of confining whales and dolphins, and people locally oppose that. Not only were there protests, but there was also some you know, local um, action by the Vancouver Parks Board, which oversaw the area where the whales and dolphins were held in, in the aquarium. And in the mid-90s, the aquarium, because of threats by the park board to crack down on them for wild capture of cetaceans, Vancouver Aquarium was forced to voluntarily, forced to voluntarily agree to um, not ever keep any animals who were, were captured from the wild. So that was a little bit of early legislative action. And, you know, the protests continued throughout that time. Um, as I mentioned, there were court cases and that uh, increase the tenor as well of, of the coverage. And there was quite a lot of discussion about the fact that they were trying to silence a filmmaker by um, suing over, you know, a film that really was honest and presented factual information. Um, another animal unfortunately died, Chester the false killer whale, which I think was, was uh, quite upsetting to a lot of people as well. Uh, all of this led to more action by the local parks board at the Vancouver Aquarium. So they uh, were under enormous pressure by people in the city and there were quite a lot of members of that parks board who themselves believed it was inappropriate for the situation to continue. And they voted in a new bylaw that um, would ban any future keeping of whales and dolphins uh, at the aquarium and also would ban performances by whales and dolphins. Um, Vancouver Aquarium decided to sue over this as well, which I think brought them more bad press. They actually made the ridiculous argument that it was a free expression right of theirs to hold whale performances, which I don't think a lot of people agreed with. Now, um, ultimately, what happened is they felt forced into the position of backing away from keeping whales and dolphins after the public outcry. The, the tone of, of, of what people wanted um, was certainly not to see whales and dolphins continue in those conditions. And Vancouver Aquarium, um, you know, rightfully read the writing on the wall. And they believed that, you know, because of the parks board move and because of this pending federal legislation, that that was likely to affect their operations. So, um, you know, while this is going on, keep in mind, and Marty will speak more about this, that the backdrop is that we do have this federal legislation pending and there's lots of discussions in Parliament as well. And I'll just share one final thing to jump back for a minute to Marine Land. Uh, we also, you know, after the initial moves and after the, the Ontario ban on keeping orcas, we also saw Marine Land actually formally charged with animal cruelty, not in relation to marine mammals, it was in relation to man ma uh, land mammals. But this, again, um, showed people and I think increased public sentiment toward wanting something to change at Marineland. So I will um, pause here and turn it over to um, Marty to discuss in more detail the legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Camille. And, and just to note, please, uh, 
If you have questions and comments, please put them in the Q&A, not the chat, the Q&A. Okay, Marty. Uh, thanks, Lori, and thanks everyone uh, for tuning in and to Camille for that great context, uh, setting up Canada's successful 2019 ban on whale and dolphin captivity for entertainment purposes through Bill S-203. Uh, at the outset, let me begin by saying I do think a similar policy is achievable in the United States, um, perhaps most likely through incremental progress at the state or local level. In fact, uh, American developments contributed to Canada's success as well. Uh, I mean, especially Blackfish, but also the orca ban in California and uh, SeaWorld's phase out of orcas, which were significant developments while the Canadian bill was being considered. And I should also note, of course, that Canada is not the only country with uh, bans or stri uh, strict restrictions on cetacean captivity. There are countries around the world, including in Europe, Central America, and India. Um, as a lawyer and advisor who worked on Canada's successful bill created by Senator Wilfrid Moore and most definitely inspired by Blackfish, I can share some info about the bill, including factors that contributed to success and some lessons learned in the journey that might be helpful to uh, efforts in the U.S. So first, uh, what exactly was Bill S-203? The legislation achieved a phase out of whale, dolphin, and porpoise captivity through prohibitions on breeding and imports under criminal animal cruelty laws and international trade laws. This is significant because comparable jurisdictions would all have criminal laws and trade restrictions. So uh, there's no, no, no uh, legal framework here that's unique to Canada. Uh, thus far, the law has prevented any new births or imports of cetaceans. And this was previously a regular occurrence with births at least almost annually, and belugas coming in from Russia, for example, captured in the wild. Um, it also prevented new dolphins from coming in, which Marineland had indicated an intent to bring more in. The bill has also imposed a licensing system on exports, restricting potential destinations for relocations. Um, and also notable, the bill imposed a ban on performance for entertainment and this has been intended to target the use of cetaceans in circus style shows. Uh, notably, Marineland in Niagara Falls, Canada is currently charged under that law for a show that took place last year. And as with, that is before the courts, and as with illegal breeding, the penalty for that offense would be a criminal conviction and a fine of up to $200,000, oh, I should mention Canadian dollars. Um, the bill does allow for the import of or export of whales or dolphins for one of two purposes, uh, either their best interests or for scientific research. The intent here was to allow imports to the whale sanctuary planned in Nova Scotia. And so the best interest recognition, which was the first in law in Canada, was uh, explicitly inspired and developed in consideration of the whale sanctuary. And uh, because Vancouver Aquarium, which was the only facility uh, purporting to do scientific activities at the time was out of the picture by the time the, the uh, ban passed. Really, the science licensing head only applies potentially to exports, so it would have the, the function of restricting places where uh, whales could potentially go, so they wouldn't be going to, you know, it's kind of the worst amusement park entertainment type uh, uh, facilities. Um, and in thinking about U.S. legal models, I would really strongly recommend the model of a prohibition with potential licensing because it creates a default and places uh, the onus to justify any new captivity or, or relocations with high standards and public accountability. And it's very difficult to argue against. It sort of says, well, if, you, if this is really your reason, make your case you know, in a legal forum where we can test the evidence. Um, Bill S203 grandfathered in all captive cetaceans in Canada, currently numbering about 40 belugas, five bottlenose dolphins, and one orca, Kiska, all at marine land, uh, with many other cetaceans having died in the course of proceedings. Um, as Camille went into, at the time the bill was proposed, the only other Canadian location with cetaceans was the Vancouver Aquarium, and all those cetaceans have, have either passed away or since been relocated, including uh, one dolphin relocated to the U.S. under the current law. I would emphasize, I don't want to make it out as though um, when Camille tells the story, there is actually, there's a clear narrative of this coming together and sort of being a culmination, but also within the legislature itself, passing the bill was incredibly difficult. This was by no means um, 
<laughs> sort of a, just an inevitable natural uh, flow. Um, and in the end, the bill passed through teamwork and determination, like incredible determination, including with a very broad coalition of, of people, including grassroots supporters and uh, NGOs like Animal Justice Camille, and also uh, a decisive element in the bill passing was the support of scientists like uh, Lori and Naomi. Uh, and that really changed the conversation, whereas opponents had said, this is an activist driven bill. You know, Senator Moore said, no, this is a scientist driven bill. And scientists made the case that was never refuted that it's inappropriate to have cetaceans uh, in captivity in, in at least most circumstances. Um, so, the, I mean, the main lesson I would say is you really need to have a to, for, to have a legislation to succeed. You never need to have a good strategy and also not give up. Um, in fact, passing Bill S two hundred three was the longest successful legislative process in Canadian history, at nearly four years. So just to highlight a few additional factors for success, I've mentioned that in proposing a bill, I think it's a good model to go for a prohibition plus potential licensing. It's very difficult to argue against that. Another main point I referenced would be advocacy through science. So people, of course, feel very strongly about this on ethical grounds, but it is also extremely important to prove a case on scientific grounds, in this case, marine biology and Lori's particular expertise in uh, neuroscience. Um, because that's irrefutable and a reasonable legislature can't be dismissive of science. It would require essentially evidence to refute it. And here it's a very strong case. And so I would, I would highlight that Lori, uh, Naomi and other scientists who were very much uh, he the heroes here and the scientific record they created can be used in the US. Uh, and if anyone is you know, making specific efforts, we have lots of materials that we can readily uh, hand over. Um, Another really important point that is not widely appreciated be the, uh, how uh, central First Nations leadership was in Canada to the success of the bill. And I guess as an American audience, you might be more familiar with you know, Native Americans. Um, but in Canada, the bill was taken over by the Honorable Murray Sinclair, who is one of Canada's most distinguished Indigenous leaders. He's a, he's a former judge, actually only the second Indigenous judge in Canada, and the former chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was a an extremely important uh, public body that documented and made recommendations in relation to Canada's history of atrocities against Indigenous children. So in the Senate, you had an extremely prominent, respected uh, leaders stepping up, and there was also a number of endorsements from coastal First Nations in Canada's Pacific Northwest. And also uh, a number of other Indigenous leaders in the Senate really refused to give up and what was this very difficult process. It's not just whether you support something, it's how much you support something. And in the Senate, you know, it was really um, a win for Senator Sinclair and, and the other Indigenous leaders. So I would, I would recommend looking for opportunities to work with uh, First Nations in the United States. And I'm, I'm aware at least of the example of Lolita in Miami as having connections to an Indigenous nation uh, from the West Coast, whose territory yeah. includes the waters where she was captured. Um, again, another big factor to success would be building on incremental progress in other countries uh, or in smaller jurisdictions. Camille referenced Ontario's ORCA ban and the Vancouver ban. Those are huge strategic advantages. Uh, you also want to have a, a very good media and social media strategy. In fact, the Bill S203 was once saved at a time when it was maybe going to be defeated. It was once saved by so many grassroots people writing letters into the Senate that it uh, crashed the Senate server. And that did save the bill. So. You know, it was sort of a, the people's bill in that regard. And another point is I wouldn't try to be partisan about this policy. It's really something anybody could get behind. And by the time the bill passed, there was uh, some support at least or complete support from all federal parties in Canada. Um, I want to leave lots of time for discussion, but I would like to quickly highlight as well um, the Jane Goodall Act, and uh, this, which is something of a sequel to Bill S-203. So it's Bill S-241. And actually, just quickly, I should mention another real factor in success was the coalition of NGOs that were back, uh, sort of backing this as well and working in coordination with media and social media. So the Jane Goodall Act builds on the legal on the laws created by Bill S-203 and would establish the strongest legal protections for captive wild animals in the world. The bill will ban over 800 species at roadside zoos and phase out elephant captivity nationally on uh, animal welfare and public safety grounds. 
Like Bill S203, the bill is based in science and indigenous values and uh, notably supported by an exciting coalition of Canada's leading zoos, including the Toronto Zoo and the Calgary Zoo, which are the country's two largest, and also by animal advocacy organizations such as uh, Camille's Animal Justice. And um, it, it was extremely exciting to see the bill named after Dr. Jane Goodall, you know, legendary hero for animals. The Honorable Murray Sinclair, who I've spoken about, introduced this bill in 2020, and Senator Marty Klein uh, has since taken over as the champion of the bill, and I'm very honored to work for him. Uh, some of the species covered by the bill include big cats, bears, wolves, seals, sea lions, walruses, hyenas, many types of primates, and also dangerous reptiles, uh, such as crocodiles and venomous snakes uh, and giant snakes. There's also an ability to add additional wild species to the bill. And an important philosophical point is that all these animals would also receive limited legal standing under the bill, which is a fairly huge precedent for animals. And the way that would work is if there was a legal breeding or performance that occurred, a court could relocate animals or uh, impose conditions. And I should also note the bill's preamble encourages the relocation of Kiska, the, la the last orca at Marineland to uh, Nova Scotia's whale sanctuary and observes that Ontario would have the legal power uh, to do this. Uh, it's not within federal jurisdiction. Uh, the, I'm pleased to report the Jane Goodall bill's process is going very well. It's early in the process, but we are optimistic. Um, and Senator Klein is optimistic that there might be hearings as soon as the fall. If you would like to help out with that bill, um, please help spread the word in the United States, get endorsements, um, share it on social media. And if you would like to try to ban whale and dolphin captivity locally, please don't hesitate to, to reach out through the whale sanctuary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marty. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to turn to uh, Naomi Rose, who, who will be able to give us uh, sort of the more US-based and international picture uh, and really address the question of uh, could it happen here? Could we ban dolphin and whale captivity in the United States? Naomi? Thanks, Lori, and hello, everybody. I don't have anything prepared because I wanted to respond more directly to what Camille and Marty um, described. So I'll just say um, the first thing that everybody should be clear on is the U.S. is not Canada primarily because in this regard, primarily because we have a lot more facilities in the U.S. We have a larger industry, a larger um, sector that is um, obviously has interest in not passing such such laws. So uh, you know it is a um, th they tend to be concentrated in certain states. And as Marty mentioned, um, California does have several facilities and yet they pass a prohibition on the public display of orcas. And so that, that shows one of the ways we can move forward with this on, in an incremental way, as Marty mentioned, which is state by state. Because while the Marine Mammal Protection Act is a federal law that supersedes state law in the, in the, you know, to the largest extent, they no longer have significant jurisdiction jurisdiction over captive marine mammals. That was a change that was made in 1994 by the industry. Public display industry changed the law, uh, worked very hard to amend the law in 1994 so that Marine Mammal Protection Act had less jurisdiction over the public display of marine mammals. They succeeded in that. And therefore, the, the primary statute that focuses on the welfare or the keeping in general of marine mammals is the Animal Welfare Act. And the Animal Welfare Act explicitly allows states to have stronger statutes um, and simply sets a minimum standard so that states cannot set weaker standards. And therefore, the uh, bill that passed in, in California is perfectly legal because although it sets a much stronger standard than the AWA, as far as orcas are concerned, the AWA allows for that. And therefore, there are other jurisdictions in the United States that have similar laws. South Carolina prohibits the public display of cetaceans, any cetacean. Uh, counties, Maui County, for example, in Hawaii does the same thing. So going state by state is one option, one tactic. And the only reason we haven't moved forward to a significant, significant extent in this regard is bandwidth. 
you know, it's their 50 states and, and many, many counties and, yeah. you know, and many, many municipalities. And it is simply difficult for us to get the sort of narrative that Camille described um, moving forward at the state level um, with our resources. We are just pretty much NGOs who have public support, but, you know, we're not funded by the government. We're not funded by, you know, uh, you know, well, occasionally we have major donors, but, you know, by some billionaire who wants this to happen. And so it is a matter of bandwidth. And some states have just had enormous um, enthusiasm for this issue, and, can't, and California was one. Somebody asked prior to the webinar why we haven't followed up with doing the same in Florida. And that is, in fact, one of the reasons why we were unable to do this in Florida. We tried. And the uh, situation in Florida is different than in California. It's a more conservative state. Its legislature, legislature is more friendly to business. It has far more marine theme parks, you know, and dolphinariums than California does. And there was simply no political route that anybody could see that would lead to a similar um, statute in Florida versus California. Uh, that doesn't mean we we give up that there may be other ways to approach this through animal welfare, strictly animal welfare. For example, a state could have stronger standards for its animal welfare care and maintenance regulations um, under state law than the Animal Welfare Act, which does have marine mammal regulations, but they are, especially when compared to global standards, you know, in other countries, in, in uh, Europe and, and um, Costa Rica and a few other places, um, our standards are actually quite weak. Uh, the UK, for example, the United Kingdom established standards that were so strict and so rigorous that they went from about 30 dolphinariums to none. It is not illegal to have a dolphinarium in the United Kingdom. It's simply um, the standards are so high, nobody was able to keep a dolphinarium open um, and be economically viable. Uh, it was just too expensive to keep the standards at the, at the level that the UK laws um, established. So we can do that state by state as well. Again, it's a matter of bandwidth. So what we really need, and I throw this out to the audience, are very enthusiastic constituents who are willing to do the vast majority of the legwork, not, not the information. We can provide that. We can help. You know, as Marty pointed out, there's the science, there's the um, information that is needed to lobby your legislatures, um, and we can provide that. But the legwork, the actual effort to get signatures on petitions, to get a, a bill introduced in your legislature, to understand who the legislators are and who would be your champions, for example, that's something that local effort is necessary for. And we need the support and the input and the effort of local activists and advocates to, to move forward with those efforts. So anybody in any state, even when even if they don't have dolphinariums um, should think about whether they're willing to put that kind of effort into um, a legislative effort at the state level or even at the municipal level. Malibu City passed an ordinance that mm -hmm. doesn't allow the public display of cetaceans. And again, Maui County, and there are others. So anywhere where there's really passionate um, public uh, effort and focus and energy um, to pass this sort of local, state, county, municipal um, statute, you know, we're, we're there to help you. Um, mm -hmm. we're, we're ready and willing to help. At the federal level, it's not that it would be illegal to pass such a statute. The Marine Mammal Protection Act can be amended, but it's a, it's a tougher sell there, particularly right now, and I won't get into the details of why right now is not a really great time to move this sort of, um, bill forward, but of course, you know, Congress is busy right now. So um, we, we have to pick our moments and we have to find our champions and we have to move this sort of thing forward in a very strategic and tactical way. There is a bill, it has not been reintroduced, so it's currently dormant, but there is a bill that would have copied basically the California bill at the federal level. That sort of went to the back burner um, in 2016 and draw your own conclusions as to why. And in a sense, that was okay, uh, not great, but okay, because SeaWorld on its own um, 
you agree to phase out the display of orcas um, over time. And they are the pretty much the main holder of orcas in the United States at this time. And so we have um, Tokate or Lolita at, at Miami's Aquarium, but she's a special situation at the moment, which I, you know, I'm sure there'll be some questions about that. But SeaWorld otherwise is the holder of, of orcas. And, and since they voluntarily agreed to phase out their animals, um, you know, through no breeding and no import, you know, the, the federal bill was set to the side. So it, I totally agree with Marty, it's possible to do this, but it is something that's probably going to have to take place at the state level. And that is a bandwidth problem. So um, we are also working, NGOs who are concerned about this issue are also working at the regulatory level under the AWA. We are trying to um, move forward with a proposed rule to improve and strengthen the marine mammal um, welfare uh, regulations that govern their care and maintenance. That has been um, another long haul that started in, in, oh my gosh, started in the mid 1990s, quite frankly, and continued through the early aughts and then um, seemed to hit its stride in 2016, but immediately came to a screeching halt. And now we're trying to get it going again. So we've always been focused on trying to improve the standards. You know, we recognize that animals are in captivity right now and need their welfare to be safeguarded. So it's a two track effort strengthening the conditions, improving conditions for the animals who are currently in captivity, working with welfare advocates to improve their conditions, and also um, trying to legislate um, at least some species uh, into the not appropriate for captivity um, you know, bin of history. So uh, that's sort of where things are standing in, in the United States at the moment. Thank you very much, Naomi. Thank you all three of you for really laying out the, this very complex picture in Canada and the United States internationally, but to also show that uh, we can do this. I mean, it's a Canada is a good example, uh, other countries as well of, of, of changing, uh, changing things uh, for the better for, for cetaceans and other animals. Um, and uh, the fact that I think I want to just uh, note Marty's point about the science, um, the fact that uh, the science is of, of why dolphins and whales should not be in concrete tanks is in. Um, it continues to grow, it continues to develop, but the fact of the matter is, is that it's, it's really incontrovertible at this point. Um, and uh, avail yourself of the science um, because it's, it's a very powerful tool to use uh, to advocate for these animals because there's very little opposing science that no one has ever written a paper and published it in a peer-reviewed journal that says why dolphins and whales should be in, in concrete tanks. Um, and so it's really important to avail yourself of, of the science. I, I want to now uh, get to some of the questions. These and we have been answering questions, typing uh, the answers to, to questions, but I, I do want to get to uh, lie answering some of these live. And, and perhaps um, one question which is really on people's minds right now is the issue of Mystic Aquarium in the United States. The fact that they uh, took five uh, beluga whales from marine land in Canada, two died, one uh, was, in, was in, I don't know, the current state was in very serious condition. And the question is, how did that happen? Um, who approved this and what animal care committee did they use um, to, to bring about uh, this exportation of five belugas to Mystic, where uh, two of them uh, passed away and one is, is not probably not doing very well. Can anyone uh, address that, Naomi? I also address this um, with a typed answer, so please um, okay. look there if you want to. But um, as Camille and Marty uh, know, there is an exemption um, under the uh, Canadian law that allows for the export for two purposes. One is research and one is for the best interests of the animal, which of course is a little 
um, it needs a definition, but you know that that's another exemption. And, and that was meant to, I believe, address the top possibility of sending them to sanctuary. But um, per research, scientific research often gets exempted from these prohibitions on trade and so on, movement around the globe, quite frankly. CITES has an exemption for scientific research. So that's always an issue. Um, so there was an exemption for that. And then in the United States, the belugas that these belugas are descended from were wild caught in Russia and they are um, uh, from a stock, from a population that was uh, declared depleted under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And our statute's very clear that the only purpose for which you can import depleted marine mammals is for research or conservation, not, not for public display. So the only reason they could have moved these animals across the Canadian US border was for scientific research. And so that is the purpose for which they were moved um, was for scientific research. As you may be aware, if you've been following this saga, you know, this was a scientific research permit, which requires a great deal of public scrutiny, a lot of input from the agencies and um, a very strict, you know, scientific um, proposal and uh, and permit conditions. And so the permit conditions were, were very strict, in fact, after a lot of public input and scientific input through the permit process, uh, the, the uh, conditions were no breeding, um, no research on reproduction, um, it's not merited at this time. And, um, you know, although they could be on public display because um, Mystic does not have a dedicated research facility and only has a public display part of its facility. Uh, they couldn't be trained for performances or anything like that. They could only be used for research. Um, so that's why the trade was allowed. And then of course we all know what happened after that. And I don't think we should get bogged down in those details, but just so you understand how the two statutes, the, um, the, the laws that S203 um, amended and the Marine Mammal Protection Act you know, how they worked was because this was with scientific research uh, transfer. Thank you. Oh, pardon me. Yeah, sure. Marty. Okay, I'd like to add a couple of, uh, of comments. Uh, so one, one uh, a bit of nuance I would bring to the way some of these laws and the Jane Goodall Act, Bill S-241 are sometimes described, is they do have um, prohibitions with potential heads of licensing. Those would not be really, um, it's a bit different than an exemption where the law would simply not apply. The good thing about a licensing process is that you actually have to get a license. And if, if in some instances where this has been applied, people would be critical of how it has been applied. The, the good, the advantage of having the law in place is that there's room to improve the licensing system through um, a public process. And, and one aspect of cetacean exports from Canada thus far has been that it had they have been attached attached to those permissions have been um, a requirement of, for a commitment not to breed and not to use this the cetaceans in performance for entertainment. There's an enforceability issue from Canada's perspective once they're outside of Canada, uh, which speaks I think to the need to improve laws in the United States as well. But in, in the bigger picture, I think another aspect where you're seeing relocations that many advocates for cetaceans would definitely view as um, imperfect uh, uh, to say the least, um, there's kind of a dilemma because no one also thinks that the cetaceans at Marineland are in good circumstances. There's been reports of, of many deaths there, uh, provincial animal welfare orders relating to water quality and a host of well-known issues that are easy to uh, find on, on the uh, online. Uh, so there's kind of a dilemma because there's not enough sanctuary capacity, at least in the near term, to take all of those whales if Marineland were agreeable to moving them. So it's, it's, I think it's conceivable that it might be in some of the whale and dolphins interests, as was the case probably with Vancouver Aquarium Dolphin, to go to comparatively better um, captivity facilities, even though we would not like in the future to see this type of captivity occur really at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but what do we do now? I think there's a bit of uh, just a practical problem where uh, there's downsides either way. Yeah, thank you so much, Marty, for, for mentioning that. I think that's a really important point. And for those of you who don't know, I mean, we've been mentioning uh, sanctuary here, um, and in particular, uh, the Whale Sanctuary Project Sanctuary in Port Hilford, Nova Scotia. And uh, we are getting ready uh, to accept uh, beluga whales and orcas uh, for next year. And of course, you know, 
we are really interested in uh, bringing the, the arc of the story in Canada uh, to fruition by bringing Kiska and some of the Belugas who may be candidates into our sanctuary, but we can't hold all of them. And so part of this is about uh, not only ending the keeping of these animals in concrete tanks for entertainment, but also promoting uh, the development of authentic sanctuaries around the world uh, where animals can go and have a much better uh, ex experience, a much better sense of well being, and a much better life still under human care. Um, than they are in concrete tanks and in entertainment parks. So um, that's also a part of the arc of the story that's that's important because you you have to have a, a an alternative. You can't just say, well, I don't want them in the tanks. Okay, so where are we where are they going? And uh, that's a big question, one that can be answered by authentic sanctuaries. Um, Let's see, other, we have so many questions. Um, I think, you know, one of the interesting questions here is by uh, someone who asked about how do we maintain welfare standards uh, in uh, and good husbandry and veterinary care in these facilities when, you know, they are, uh, their financial streams may be shut down due to, uh, uh, activity to, to, to decrease ticket sales. What happens in, in, at those kinds of facilities in terms of caring for the animals? Naomi? Yeah, I mean, that's a fair question. You know, be careful what you wish for. Let's say we closed all the facilities tomorrow. Um, that would be a bit of a conundrum for all of us because there are many, many animals that need care. And therefore, the approach we've been taking for the past few years, because we've given this a lot of thought, um, is not to say shut them down tomorrow. That That is not how we're approaching this. We are talking mm -hmm. about phasing these um, exhibits out. Right. Um, just notice Miami Sea Aquarium, which is, of course, was founded on, on cetaceans and has had Lolita and prior to his death, Hugo, um, as a major um, exhibit in it, most of its most of its history. It was founded in 1955 and Hugo came in 1968, Lolita came in 1970, and she's been there ever since. So their identity is very largely focused on the, their orcas. And yet they are now, she's off exhibit and she is now being considered for retirement. Although who knows what her future will be. I'm not making any promises or claims or anything, but the point being that she's currently not on exhibit and yet they're not closing down. The idea that removing the dolphin exhibits or the cetacean exhibits will cause all these parks to crash and burn has not been borne out by history. When they close these exhibits, they continue. There are some facilities, of course, that are entirely founded. They have nothing else but, you know, say a swimming program for dolphins. And quite frankly, they are likely to go out of business if dolphins become illegal to hold in captivity. But the vast majority of these places are marine theme parks. They mm -hmm. have other attractions. They have other emphases and they can replace a lot of these live exhibits, these living animal exhibits with other things such as, you know, CGI, virtual reality, um, immersive exhibits that use modern technology. And again, that's not just um, rhetoric. It's, it's actually occurred in some of these places. And mm -hmm. so um, several facilities over the years have closed their cetacean exhibits, not because of any activity on our part, any activism, but simply because they decided to do that for whatever reason. Maybe they were no longer able to acquire replacement animals or it had all just become very expensive or too expensive because in fact, it's expensive to keep these animals as we in the sanctuary world are very mm -hmm. well aware. So um, they, 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 and yet they remained open. So the argument that closing the dolphin exhibits will cause the whole facility to fall apart financially isn't borne out by experience. And so all we're asking is for phase out not shut it all down tomorrow. And meantime, yes, we do want to improve the standards these animals are living under, which is the whole regulatory effort that we're undertaking at many different levels. Again, state, federal, international, you know, we're trying to get better standards in place. And there's a whole scientific 
study, a uh, whole scientific uh, discipline out there about animal welfare, animal welfare science that is now focused on cetaceans. So, yeah. you know, the fact that we are trying to improve the world, the life of the animals that are going to have to stay in place, there will be no room at the end for them. We, you know, we will have it sanctuaries, but there's 3,000 captive cetaceans in the world. We're not going to be able to house them all. And they will have to stay in place, but they can be phased out, breeding stopped, trade stopped, and their standards, their conditions improve. That, to me, is as realistic and practical and honest and fair as you can possibly get when you're trying to actually close you know, something down. And we're not asking them to do it tomorrow. We're asking them to phase this out. That's a really important point. Camille. Yeah, if I could just jump in, um, I, I think with respect to marine land, there's some additional context here. So marine land, uh, you can still display cetaceans in Canada, captive cetaceans, and marine land continues to do so. They're not supposed to have them perform, although they have been doing so. Um, but, you know, despite that, their ticket sales, and I don't know, they're a private company, so we don't know their numbers, but I can tell you, I was there down at the parking lot on open day, um, opening day for the season this year on the May long weekend in Canada, and it was empty, according to people who've seen it in other years. Um, that's been the report from Marine Line for quite some time is that attendance is down and ticket sales are down. And I think that's an inevitable consequence of people appreciating the reality of what cetaceans go through and withdrawing their support from these facilities. So, and, and I don't think it's necessarily linked to the captive display. I think it's linked to shifting attitudes, but it is a concern yeah. that, uh, you know, these whales are still there and in these conditions that many consider non-ideal. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that in marine lands case that decline in ticket sales means they can't afford to provide for these animals because it's a privately held family company from what I understand has quite a lot of, of assets and built up wealth over time with this business. But I think to Naomi's point, it really speaks to the need for a transition plan and not simply just calling for the closure of these facilities tomorrow, which is not realistic. And one thing that we try to point out in our advocacy is that government should be playing a role in this transition. It shouldn't be on the shoulders of NGOs in the sanctuary community to try to find solutions to these problems, but there should be a much more active role um, by government in promoting the use of sanctuaries and taking over and mandating standards for the types of aquariums that are still in existence while we transition out of this one phase to a new phase. I think that's really important. Can, Camille, uh, can you speak to I mean, that this brings about this issue of transparency. And, you know, a lot of people want to know, how is Kiska, for instance? Um, we hear from time to time about the beluga whales uh, at marine land and the diminishing numbers and so forth. But um, are there ways to uh, enforce transparency on the part of a private company like marine land? Or is, are there... Is there some way to, to, to find out and work with them to find out exactly what the status is of the animals that they hold? Yeah, that's a good point, Laurie. It, it's, it's actually enormously challenging in, in Canada and Ontario to get any information about the welfare of any animals housed in marine land, either from marine land or from authorities. Um, you know, so I think most visitors who go to marine land, especially people, you know, listening to this webinar today would be able to identify quite a few welfare problems pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And on that basis, animal justice has filed numerous complaints with law enforcement authorities mm -hmm. in the province about the well being of Kiska, who's been held by herself at marine land now for going on over 10 years. Um, Lori, as you know well, and, and many of you have probably seen, there's videos that continually emerge of Kiska slamming her body against the side of her tank and performing stereotypic behaviors, um, floating listlessly in her pool, and in circumstances that scientific experts have identified as, as incredibly problematic. Um, we filed complaints about Kiska with law enforcement authorities. They have sort of vaguely indicated that they may be doing something about the situation. I've heard rumors about consultants that they may have hired, but they refuse to share any information publicly about what they have done. And the same goes for any other animals at Marine Land. The only way we do hear something is if it occasionally gets into court, which is a uh, you know, complicated procedure I won't get into. But it's incredibly rare. So, Lori, I think, you know, to your point about transparency, it is incredibly important. Um, I know the U.S. Animal Welfare Act leaves a lot to be desired, but it is a much more transparent system than what we have. And it's something I hope at least Canada can emulate in the future. 
can I add um, a comment as well? If, if uh, Bill S-241, the Gene Goodall Act, proceeds uh, to committee, and certainly Senator Klein is optimistic it will, it could happen as soon as the fall, uh, parliamentary committee hearings on you know, animal welfare issues in Canada covered by the legislation would provide a public opportunity to explore some of these uh, these issues on the record. And, and for example, um, several uh, species you know are, are added uh, that would be present at marine land so for example uh seals they have quite a number of seals i gather uh, sea lions and walruses they both have that are con uh, continue to be used in performance for entertainment notably the walruses the smooshy and koyak as advocated uh, many would know by uh, former trainer phil demers and marine land also has a very substantial number of bears uh, so the bill covers bears in addition the bill creates um this limited legal standing for cetaceans, so it enhances laws for cetaceans and, and um, recognizes Ontario's jurisdiction to grant uh, KISCA the ORCA legal standing, which would be essentially what that is, is an observation that the province could legislate a system similar to what some had hoped to see for happy uh, the elephant at the Bronx Zoo, whereby an, an animal in, in, certain, in situations of concern might actually have some rights to a hearing themselves. But all that to say, uh, parliamentary hearings would provide a public forum to explore these issues and hopefully to mm -hmm. hear from Greenland what their vision is for the future of these animals. Thank you, Marty. We are really uh, at the end of our uh, hour, but what I uh, wanted to do was to sort of go around and ask everyone uh, to, to maybe just say something quickly to our audience about uh, about this issue and uh, how they can get involved or how they can uh, work towards, as we said, phasing out um, the keeping of these wild animals in tanks. Um, I'll start with Naomi. Sure, uh, as I said, um, this effort is largely driven by um, public sentiment. And when it comes to incremental progress, it requires the dedication, energy, and passion of local people at the local level, whether it's a city, you know, county, state, province, or, you know, at, you know, once we get to the federal level, whoever is championing that um, statute, um, whoever the, the co-sponsors of the bill are, for example. So, um, you know, we have the information, we have the science, we have the sort of tactical and strategic um, thoughts that we can share, but we're limited in bandwidth. And so we need um, uh, local folks to put the effort in and, and, and help us uh, move the you know, move the, 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 the effort forward and you know, shift the paradigm. So um, thanks for everybody who's attending. You're already um, halfway there, quite frankly. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Naomi. Camille? Yeah, just to follow up on what Naomi says, human beings and individuals in this process can make a massive difference. I, I didn't get into the, the weeds of this so much, but in the 90s, when the Vancouver Aquarium was forced to back away from the wild capture cetaceans, and uh, before the Parks Board, more recently, when the Parks Board banned the local um, you know, captivity in the future of whales and dolphins in Vancouver, that was a process that was extremely citizen oriented. It was not driven by NGOs. It was not driven by us or any other large organizations. It was local citizen advocates who were so fed up with what the aquarium was doing and the fact that decades later, there were still cetaceans. So your voice really does matter. You can have an enormous impact and local organizing can get quite a lot done, especially at the city or state level. So don't be daunted by thinking it's a really big task. As Naomi mentioned, there's lots of resources out there. There are now precedents to point toward. And I think uh, you need to believe in yourself and what you can accomplish. Thank you, Camille. Thank you so much. That's so true. Marty? I would definitely agree with those comments. And I would say, um, you know, progress anywhere helps everywhere. So don't be daunted. If, um, you know, engage local officials, be it at the city level, uh, at the state level, and show them also that there's some upside to this in terms of public opinion. The, the, you know, a lot of people are enthusiastic about these changes. Um, if, you know, from, from, where the Jean, from where the whale bill started to where the Jane Goodall bill is now, there's 
been few, if any, critics publicly of the Gene Goodall bill. So I think Camille really um, you know, got it right in terms of public attitudes are driving this change. So, and I think public attitudes, and Senator Moore would always say that, you know, public attitudes were considerably far ahead of where policy and um, political or parliamentary discussions were. So show them that um, that this is positive and don't give up and no win is uh, is too small. And also if you could, uh, you know, any uh, uh, sharing, different organizations sharing each other's initiatives on social media, for example, is a, a really big help. That, that's a great point. Uh, yeah, I mean, successes and, mo and progressive movement in one area does have an impact in other areas, locations and so forth. Uh, it just it just does. Um, and uh, so, you know, I want to thank the audience for these tremendous questions, these substantive questions. Uh, we hope that we can, you know, get to all the unanswered ones uh, afterwards. Um, but I really appreciate everyone uh, joining us and especially uh, the panel, Marty, Naomi, and Camille, for sharing your expertise and your insights and taking the time uh, to do this. And uh, I, from the Whale Sanctuary Project, uh, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us if you're interested in, in what we're doing or what any of us are doing. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. And again, thank you. Thank you so much. Be well, everyone. Glory. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.